Welcome to Innovating Music, a podcast from the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Gigi Johnson. Jeremy Gruber is our guest this week. He is head of digital and strategy for Friends at Work, works with John Legend, Lindsay Sterling, and a bunch of other great artists, and also um, other creators and innovators and thinkers in their whole um, social activism business, which is fascinating and I'll talk a bit about. But he'll talk about content marketing and creative marketing to connect directly those um, creators and innovators uh, and social innovators directly to their fans, ways to do it across multiple platforms, ways to do it not just depending on playlists or single social media platforms. And I'll talk about some of the tricks and tools and also about Found E, something that he is a partner on that is looking at some of the issues in terms of supporting um, ad based technologies. Please enjoy this podcast which will cover the gamut of what's happening both across music in terms of fan relations, as well as specific um, examples of folks who are doing cool and interesting things in that direct to fan environment. What the heck is Friends at Work? How did you end up there? And what what does it mean to be head of digital marketing and strategy? Friends at Work, at its core, is a artist management company that focuses on musicians. That's, that's kind of our bread and butter. Um, the company's main clients w- were founded with John Legend and Lindsey Sterling. Tyce DeClorius is our founder and um, CEO. And Adina Friedman, who is our co-president of management, has been managing Lindsay Sterling. So uh, Ty has been with John Legend for about 13 years. Uh, Adina has been with Lindsay Sterling and, uh, and Ty for, I think, seven, six, seven years now. Uh, Ty had worked under other managers with John for the majority of her career. Uh, Gary Gersh at the Artist Organization, followed by Troy Carter, where she was the co-president. On at Adam Factory, and then uh, about four years ago, she stepped out on her own. Troy was moving on to Spotify. There were some changes to her, to her career, so she start founded her own company with John Legend and Lindsey Sterling. Um, I was one of the first executive hires. I had been the VP of Digital at Concord Music Group, and uh, Friends at Work is now a, a management company with an eye to social impact. So. Our, our music client base is John Legend, Lindsey Sterling, Raphael Sadiq, Ruthann, uh, Ruthann, who is a songwriter named Ruthann Cunningham, um, who's written songs for Niall Horan, um, Britney Spears, and she's a, an amazing singer in her own right and um, just had a great feature on um, Love Island in UK. And so she's blowing up a little bit right now. Spielberg, who's a great alt alternative pop artist and a young pop singer uh, signed to Island Records uh, named Frawley. And then a young pop duo uh, right out of USC, two USC graduates who are doing great uh, called Voila. And then we also have a social impact side of our business. So trying to do good in the world with the voice that um, being a creator can bring to the table. So um, that's most well-formed in the work that John Legend does uh, in criminal justice reform um, and equity in education and modern segregation, which is kind of the, the work he's doing to towards uh, a more equitable future. Uh, Lindsey Sterling has done a lot of work uh, in mental health, especially in uh, youth mental health and, and teens as somebody who's been very outspoken about her own struggles. Um, and then we also are just starting a social impact management side of our business. Uh, so we've recently signed on managing, um, Erica Chidi Cohen, who's a great educator in women's health, um, and a doula and brings a lot of great information about, uh, women's health and reproductive health and reproductive rights throughout the whole life. Um, and, uh, the amazing, uh, attorney Neil Katyal, uh, who you will see on MSNBC 
pretty much weekly. Um, he's a professor at Georgetown, former solicitor in the Obama administration, an amazing uh, TV personality and speaker. Um, and we've actually been working with for a couple of years an astronaut, Katie Coleman, who is just one of the most charming people, public speaker, um, explorer in residence at ASU um, and uh, retired uh, colonel in the Air Force, a pilot, PhD chemist. Um, she's, she's just an amazing person all around. So uh, we manage her for a public speaking career and, and her future after being uh, retired from NASA. So it's kind of a long range of things. And what my specific job as head of digital marketing and strategy, it's a it's an interesting role. And I think what it really means is facilitating the direct conversation between the artist and their audience, because or the creator, as I would say now, because we're not just talking about musicians, but um, my background, as I'll get into, is very much in music and in the music industry. And so the, the main, one of the main changes that I, I see from the, for lack of a better term, traditional uh, uh, recorded music industry, uh, basically pre-2000s, is the ability and the expectation for an artist to communicate directly with their audience and own that relationship. And that's really my job here. And that sits in many different places. So record labels have digital marketing departments that manage essentially content that would be used for that communication. And I'm on the management side because artists have any number of revenue streams. I mean, John Legend, by way of example, has a wine label, LVE. He has a touring business, a merch business. We do VIP programs. Um, he has a film and TV production company, Get Lifted Films. There's a lot to me communicate to an audience besides just, hey, my new single's out. And they're all different partners. So my job, my team's job, is to manage that direct communication flow in a way that reaches his audience and hopefully collects data over time that lets us continue to talk to that audience um, and help it grow so that his career uh, continues to grow, um, which for someone like John Legend sounds almost impossible. He's already gotten he got he's at forty and he's got all these amazing things going on. I'm gonna pause a second. Yeah. So for people who don't know what an EGOT is. Mm. <laughs> an EGOT is a rare uh achieve. a rare bird. It sounds like a rare bird. Yes. Um there's only it does sound like a bird. Uh there are only fifteen people at the time of this recording who have gotten full EGOTs. There's a couple of, you know, slides here and there because there's like daytime Emmys and things like that that also add to that role but the 15 core Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Tony. So John Legend has an Emmy as a, from a being the producer of Jesus Christ Superstar, uh, the, the live television performance. He has 10 Grammys. He has an Oscar for writing the song Glory for uh, Ava DuVernay's film Selma. Um, and he has a Tony for producing the Broadway play Jitney, uh, uh, which is an August Wilson play. Um, mm -hmm. So part of the same, if you ever saw the um, Denzel Washington film Fences, it's, it's mm -hmm. part of the same kind of series. Uh, Jitney, I correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I believe Jitney's part of that same world. And uh, he produced a revival of that play. So you kind of get to the question, which is possibly even way beyond our conversation, how he has time to sleep. But it sounds in part because there's teams of people to support him. I'm going to back up one more step. This is just me and a crazy small thing. Why is it called Friends at Work? Oh, that's a good, actually a good question. Um, so the two people who really started the company are Ty Stachlorius and Rob English. Uh, Rob English is our creative director. He actually runs his own company. Um, Friends at Workshop, which is our creative department. They can do beginning to end commercials, whatever whatever someone needs done, ideation, album artwork. Uh, the, the Pampers commercial John was in around the Super Bowl. They did that beginning to end. Um, Rob was talking to Ty. Ty went, it has many meanings, but the real origin story is that Ty grew up going to Quaker school in Philadelphia. Uh -huh. And Quaker schools are called friends schools. 
and the Quaker ideology. Now, I'm a, I'm a Jewish kid from New Jersey. I'm learning all, all of this is things I've learned as an adult. But um, the Quaker ideology is that you speak when you are moved to speak and you share, you, you, you are moved to share your voice. And she wanted to bring that ideology into the workplace. Um, wanted to, obviously all the other meanings that go on around friends also matter here. So, you know, wanting to have friends at work. And there was an article, so that brought the friends idea in. And then there was an article, I think that came out right when she was founding the company, was that like something like 65% of people don't believe they have friends at work or something. It was like a, a large, larger than you would think number of people don't have friends in their work. Um, and she felt that was kind of sad. She wanted to create an environment where we could all be friends and like actually want to come to work and want to grow as people. So the Quaker thing started it. And one day Ty and Rob looked at each other and, Ty, and Rob was just like, friends at work has to be the name of the company. And that was, is my understanding of the story is it kind of comes from her upbringing in a Quaker school combined with kind of this zeitgeist moment of not work-life balance, but work-life integration of just everything is one. So I was talking to a reporter on a totally different topic this past week. And we were talking about why this is a unique time in music to do things that are beyond what traditional labels did. And I look at what you guys are doing as rethinking the entire business of what's done with and without labels and what's done with and without the creator voice. Why is this a great time for this company to be thriving and what triggers it to thrive? I think it's a, a unique time because of what I was talking about earlier, that direct to audience communication, the expectation that you're going to that you're going to talk directly to an audience and provide an authentic relationship directly from the artist to the audience. And that word authenticity gets thrown around like crazy to the point that it's essentially meaningless, but authenticity can be whatever it is with whatever it has to be within the brand you're trying to communicate. And, and it is a gut thing. So it's really hard to say, you know, one thing is authentic and one thing isn't. And, and sometimes you, grab it afterwards. But I think the answer to your question is that the internet has done an amazing job of democratizing distribution. We can own distribution mechanisms. We can own email databases, SMS databases if we want. Social media, while it's ever changing and moving, does allow for that window into the world and creativity um, and then there's also, you know, if you advertising and data, data management uh, from from retargeting to all kinds of, you know, ways of reaching new people. You don't need a hundred million dollar organize, you know, annual budget uh, to invest in things to be able to do those kinds of things, or a billion dollar investment strategy into hundreds of artists to do those kinds of things. You can do it at the artist level with really reasonable investments and build a, a career with resources that exist at um, a few people's fingertips instead of a large uh, diversified company like a major label. I mean, major labels exist um, and they're having a heyday also because of the digital marketplace. Um, mm -hmm. You know, major labels exist based on diversification. We exist based on specificity of a few artists, and then we diversify those audience, the, how we monetize those audiences. So rather than diversifying on a traditional scale of a major label where you have, you know, a uh, hundred releases a year and 10 of them make money and pay for the whole thing. I just made up those numbers to be round. We have one artist with 10 businesses and all of them are making money. Um, so John Legend, like I said, has a number of businesses and we're diversifying his revenue streams versus diversifying a huge base of artists. Um, and then the scaling is to apply that model to multiple artists um, so that you can, you can grow that, and then scale it into a real business, um, but it's there. There's there's less risk involved because you're really everything exists 
in a digital space. It's it, you're not you're not spending. You still need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get things on the radio, but that's not the only way to generate revenue for an artist. So I'm gonna back up half a step. So you said uh, email list. You also said SMS systems. So that is text messaging. What mm -hmm. are you doing with SMS systems? I tend to think there's a there's services out there that I can use that to connect up with my fans. But what what's the superpower there in dealing with SMS, and why is that important in a social media world? You know, we are uh, being honest. We are currently mostly using it as one off. We are not really collecting huge SMS databases or investing in that. And the reason for that is it is still an area where privacy rights are rightfully so very strict. Moving those databases is very strict and expensive. So the opt in tends to, whereas email, the opt in tends to be with the artist, the overall brand for which you're subscribing in SMS. My understanding is that the opt-in is a little bit harder to move around. I think that's getting a little easier in politics because I wound up on Beto O'Rourke and <laughs> Bernie Sanders, <laughs> both their SMS lists without requesting it for their presidential runs this year. I, I, did, not I did not request that. I was supporting Beto in his uh, Texas run, and then he just put me right on his uh, presidential run, and I actually unsubscribed. No offense to Beto. Um, but anyway, in the music industry, we generally use it as one-offs. Uh, there's a great startup that we work with uh, called Seated um, that helps us with our direct-to-fan pre-orders for tours. So uh, pre-orders and any, any time that an artist owns their own ticketing and checkout, where they own the tickets, not Ticketmaster. And then when they do own the ticket, when Ticketmaster does own it, they help us with the pre-orders. They're a data collection and e-commerce company that sells tickets and they use SMS for us. And we find super effective email data collection and uh, super effective sell-through. So right now for me, SMS is really that fast response. You get a text message 15 minutes before uh, the tickets going on sale and mm -hmm. we sell between our VIP program and our pre-order, we'll sell 20% of a tour in a morning and I won't have to wake up and get out of bed because I've hired somebody else to run it and they're doing it perfectly. Um, and sometimes it's good for a shopping cart abandonment as well. True. Yep. And I know that I, I know that Shopify, it's one of its superpowers for non-music sides of things. And mm -hmm. I know I did not sign up for that, but I get reminded <laughs> for anybody who uses Shopify that I've abandoned a shopping cart. Like, ah, okay, fine, I'll buy that. Um, so you are then having to deal with fans across many different platforms and data sources and social media platforms. How do you know who's who, who's what, who overlaps, who's a super fan or, or loving, the, loving the, the creator? How do you segment and coordinate in what seems like a really messy world? Um, to some degree, we allow the world to be messy. Um, that, that is a real thing. Um, to some degree, I would say in the social media world, we tend to reward um, creativity and engagement so from you know when john released his single a good night last year it was a it was a dancey song we found a fan who had choreographed at his dance studio a <clears throat> a dance with his students that was really good to the song we posted it on his main Instagram feed and then that surfaced more people who came in and started sharing it their own dances and we started sharing those in stories so, so to some degree we're looking it within the social media world and we're just pulling out those who are so moved by what we're doing that uh, we can we, we, we feature them we use them um, Lindsay Sterling has fans doing artwork of her all day long um, so we, she reposts those. She has like fan art days that she'll post. People do drawings of her and the characters she creates. Um, within email lists, we do segmentation. Every time we load a new email list into one of our databases, we, we tag it and segment where it came from. Rarely, we, we rarely have to go back to it. There are a few cases in which we do. Um, a fun example is, you know, John runs a um, 
a VIP program before every tour date. It's a great wine tasting and it's expensive. Um, it's, it comes with high end food, high end wine, a meet and greet with John. And so what we were able to do with that is say we, when John was doing his, uh, Christmas special on NBC last year, we wanted John and some of his friends, including Megan Trainer and a few other celebrities to go out and sing Christmas carols to people in October which is weird to do in Southern California where it's 85 degrees in October. Um, and so we searched his VIP email list and we emailed them and gave him a sign up form that said, Hey, if you live in Van Nuys and you're available on this date and you don't mind John Legend stopping by, um, we'll <laughs> do this. And what, what better way to find the most hardcore fans in the world than to go to a segment of people who are in the area, you know, where they are, um, have paid five to seven hundred dollars to meet the artist and help that use that to help schedule. So that's kind of a fun way. Um, we do uh, email those people directly uh, to help join the wine club. So we know the most hardcore John Legend fans through the people who are spending the most money on him. Those are our quote unquote whales. But to be honest, um, oh, before you move by whales, sure. what is the, what's the whales metaphor? So in uh, e-commerce marketing, I know in all marketing, I guess, there's, especially in direct consumer and music industry, uh, post you know, 2008, we like to think about uh, whales, dolphins, and minnows. So uh, think of the biggest fish in the sea, or not you know, mammals, uh, are whales, uh, dolphins are medium sized, and minnows are tiny. So uh, the, the way I relate to that is um, one of the places that I got my start was in direct consumer e-commerce which is if you think about in the music industry, most of the industry we have sold music to people in record stores, inclusive of iTunes. iTunes is the biggest record store in history. Um, <clears throat> even though it's being sunsetted, it, it was in its, in its heyday. Um, people went to a store and bought music. Well, in a time when you can understand and answer the question that you're asking me right now, Gigi, is, if you, if you have the most hardcore fans in the world in a database in one place, why would you sell them a $10 download? That, what's the point of that? There are a large group of those people, that's all they want, but there's going to be a segment of those people that want to spend $50. There's gonna be a segment of those people that want to spend $100. There is gonna be a segment of people that you cannot price a product high enough mm -hmm. for them to be scared away from it. So, that is the answer to this. so the the people who want to spend the ten dollars on you know that digital download or that cd those are your your minnows the people who want to spend the 50 to 100 dollars those might be your dolphins those might be the whales for some artists Lindsay is a is a very price conscious artist so her her whales are only 100 to 250 dollars by her, her choice um john legend his whales get you know 500 to a thousand dollars easily um, and then there's artists, I mean, I ran a direct consumer e-commerce campaign for George Benson uh, at, when I was a, a VP at Concord, or before I was a VP at Concord, actually. And we were selling guitars and amps uh, and music lessons from George uh, for $10,000. And we sold them. Eee, wow. Yeah. So whales can be, can be big. I um, used to... Uh... I'm on career nine as longtime listeners will know. And one of the things I was a banker for about 10 years and for a while I was a banker to the casinos. So very familiar from that lens <laughs> at whales, <laughs> dolphins and minnows. And I also, also used to bank some of the theme parks and actually construction of some of the theme parks. And a lot of it was to figure out, you know, there's definitely layers of, you know, what your ARPU is and you've got average of how much people will, will drop on a visit but there is a big spectrum and to figure out in that environment who the, who the whales are and what the product mix is to allow opportunities. And I, I might frame it that in the music industry for a long time, we weren't necessarily abundantly allowing those opportunities for people to have a different engagement with the artist. Exactly. And, and other sectors like TV still doesn't in many ways have another <laughs> way to engage with it. Music has that benefit at least of having various types of understandable engagements. Um, and that, and, it, and it also, it changes based on where you are. Like I'm a, you know, I like to play blackjack and poker occasionally, but I'm a minnow at a casino. I'm a, 
probably a dolphin at your average concert where I'm a fan. And then I might be a whale at, you know, my favorite band, like a Nine Inch Nails concert. I'm, you know, looking at the $300 photo thing, photo thing that they're selling, you know, autographs and stuff. So it's like, you change where you are. You can be different for every, every, as a consumer. You can or, be- Or a, even who you're well, with, because yeah, true. It, it may be that I'm taking, you know, taking my family to Disneyland. I'm going to have a different engagement than me going myself someplace. Uh, and how much I might spend on loved ones who love this. So gifting and other things are, and, and knowing other people in the mix, because we don't tend to go to concerts alone is, is some of the challenge. Mm -hmm. So how does one, uh, the whole streaming market is growing. How does, or I should say it's growing at a slower rate now in the US though, supposedly as, as of mid 2019. How does one look at growth and directions and planning for growth in the strategy hat you wear? And how do you see things going that you guys can stir the pot on? That is a big, big challenge. Um, and honestly, um, I can't answer with a ton of confidence in what's going to work, but I can answer with what I'm looking at. So, the main thing, first of all, it's very different promoting an artist who is new and an artist who's established. So I'm gonna kind of have two different tracks on this conversation and I'll start with new and then I'll get into established. So if you can help me, help me track that a little bit. Okay. So new artists, in my opinion, it's content marketing and being po be, growing popularity everywhere is going to help you build a career into longevity and being smart about taking opportunities is going to help you grow a career into longevity so i don't personally think there was a moment about from about 2014 15 maybe when when playlists on spotify when they when they sunsetted the spotify apps which was a thing i won't get into I it i miss those i know i built one um, and they, when they sunsetted Spotify apps and they ramped up user playlists and then they sunsetted user playlists and ramped up owned playlists, there was a moment when one could be a new artist, reach certain people at Spotify, create relationships and grow a career through one platform. And there's a handful of artists, very small handful of artists that did it either through relationships or like Wolfpack Peck, who did it through cleverness. You know, Wolfpack is an interesting example because they're the ones who financed the tour with a silent album. And they just told all their fans, they had fans, to go just leave it on overnight. And it actually, ch Spotify changed the rules, but they raised $40,000 um because before spotify changed the rules doing that but they're actually an extraordinarily talented band i have nothing to do with them they're just an amazing like funk pop band that really talented and they've gone on to have a bigger career than they had when they started doing that and then there's artists like lao who really built a career off spotify um you know with a wall and kind of building great content around it and the, the whole there's 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 been a ca careers built through um good playlist placement we are currently moving out of that phase that phase is going to start moving on as people are leaving spotify who did that before uh, you know started with um tuma leaving years ago but now mike began is leaving and there's been changes and they're moving more towards algorithms so it's going to be harder and harder to predict and harder and harder to break into and more like a youtube type world where what's popular is surfaced by what an algorithm sees working versus what a human being sees, or maybe not. They might change their mind and move back. I don't know. Um, so in those cases, I think being popular elsewhere matters. Cultivating your social media, being great live, having some really good syncs, like bringing all elements of your world into your career and not trusting uh, Spotify as a marketing plan. There's a company that I think was founded recently of, of friend of mine um, from my Concord days, Philip Bailey, uh, was on a panel at South by Southwest uh, that was just Spotify is not a marketing plan. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, I think that that's true. I think um, 
you can't depend upon Spotify and playlisting to be the only thing that helps you grow, just like you can't depend on Instagram to be the only thing that helps you grow, or YouTube to be the only thing that helps you grow. You have to have a holistic career, make great content, be great live, and start the right partnerships to help you. And, and okay. great content, though, is not exclusively great songs. True. And that, and that depends, and then what great content means depends on your artist. Um, I mentioned an artist, Voila, that we're working with. Um, they have great, great songs. Um, their uh, next phase is really going to grow out of the fact that um, they need to help grow their social media. They've been, they've been growing their live experience a lot. They've been doing some great opening slots, playing great festivals. Um, one of the members of the band is going to be a, a uh, star in a Netflix uh, film that's coming out in September uh, called Tall Girl. So Luke Eisner is going to be the male lead opposite the, it's a, it's a great movie that's coming out next, next month. Um, so there's other things happening in those artists' world in addition to the fact that they write great music. Um, I'm going to get into the established artist element also. Mm -hmm. um, something that I've noticed uh, looking at data, because that's actually one of the great things about Apple and Spotify and YouTube is that they provide data uh, directly back to the creators. Um, it's limited and each, each platform provides their own amount. Um, Spotify for Artists is a pretty robust platform Not and Apple for Artists is growing and it's still, I think, technically in beta. Uh, YouTube Studio is the most in-depth of them. It's obviously, it's owned by Google. They're a data company. Um, one thing, and, and they're rolling out, I think, features that are going to be even more in depth. Um, one thing that I've noticed, especially looking at an artist like John Legend, is that music, this sounds like an obvious statement, but it actually has really big meaning. And that is music that is promoted specifically to streaming does better on streaming. And what I mean by that is... John's biggest song on streaming is All of Me, obviously. The mm -hmm. second biggest song is Beauty and the Beast, which is a Disney-promoted piece that he did with Ariana Grande, who's one of the biggest artists in, in the world. Actually, she was the number one most streamed artist in the world for several weeks uh, before uh, Khalid uh, kicked her off the spot for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, everything behind that is pretty much hits from his catalog. So number, if you go one through 10, you have some great songs from his catalog ending with his first hit, Ordinary People, which is usually hovers on a monthly listenership basis around eight or nine, most listened to tracks in the last 28 days. One thing I noticed looking at his data is that the songs, the singles we've released in the last year, not attached to an album, which are Preach and A Good Night, neither of which had huge radio presences, but both are heavily in the Spotify algorithm, were heavily playlisted, had huge features. John's a, you know, he's a top 200 most streamed artist in the world, consistently has never fallen below 200 since Spotify has been telling you how many, you know, where they rank if you looked in the app. Mm -hmm. Those two songs are in his top 10 most streamed songs every single month since they came out. They are no longer being promoted to radio. They are not heavily promoted to Spotify. We're not pitching them to playlists. They're just in the algorithm and they're streaming forever. They're in playlists and they're streaming. And so what that leads me to believe, how does that create action? How does that kind of that data create action? To me, what that means is that we need to rethink our single release structure from the last album where we released one single to the next album where we should release several, three or four. Mm -hmm. um, we should not be doing things where we're releasing. I mean, if you're Ed Sheeran, you can do whatever you want. So you can do the, the I'm going to release a single every week because Spotify is going to bend over backwards for Ed Sheeran. John Legend is a big artist, but he's not a, you know, the artist where every partner just says, we'll do whatever you want. Um, only a few of me, you know, Ariana Grande, Taylor Swift, Ed Sheeran, et cetera, the only artists that are in that echelon. Um, we are going to release singles farther apart and several before the album comes out next time, probably. That's the, that's the plan right now unless something changes. And the hope is that every single you release generates a little bit more audience 
and generates a little bit more growth and a couple more singles that are in the algorithm that are streaming outside of their quote unquote hit level in the marketplace. They're just elevating a little bit more and a little bit more and we'll grow an audience so that by the time the album comes out in full, we've amassed a bigger group of people who want to go listen to it. So that's really the way we're thinking about strategy and looking at streaming as, you know, how do algorithms affect listening and how does being in an algorithm, you know, like existing within an algorithm, um, affect an audience overall and audience growth. So one of our earlier guests, Amadea from PEX, talked about that for uh, big name artists, only on average 1% of their listening is where stuff was originally released. And 99% from their data that they look at across 30 different platforms, 99% uh, is remixed, remixed, re-whatevered, and then redeployed by a fan or someone in a meme or whatever. Do you guys look at that stuff and figure out how to... Um, set the narrative, embrace the narrative, track where the heck things are going. Uh, Cause I would assume that, that John Legend's work and Lindsay's work is sometimes morphed into other people's creative work. Mm -hmm. It is, um, we do look at it. I can't really give an ex a concrete example of what we do with that other than the sharing when it's great. Like I said, mm -hmm. like, I said like I said earlier, um, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think, a very large percentage, greater than 50%, but I can't give you an exact number mm -hmm. of John Legend's streaming on YouTube. And I don't think this is surprising, mm -hmm. uh, is people watching or listening to UGC videos of all of me. <laughs> and that's not a remix. That's the original master being uploaded. Right. And then them doing something with it. So getting married, lyric videos, lyric videos are huge. People are just posting the lyrics. And that's, I think that's very algorithmic. Um, and that's uh, because that's what's choosing what gets served next. Um, and I think that's what um, people are just kind of flowing through that. Um, but honestly, I, I can't really say we have a huge strategy around um, engaging that other 99%. Uh, I know that sounds crazy, but that kind of exists in a place like Lindsay, for example, who's a YouTube first artist. Um, we have a, an MCN who's responsible for collecting revenue on that. So that's a giant revenue stream. Um, but I wouldn't say that 99% is the most engaged audience, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, because of the algorithmic nature mm -hmm. um, of, of what's serving them. Um, that's probably where the listening's happening. It's a great discovery audience, but it's not necessarily the most engaged, um, you know, high revenue generating audience. So, um, you share a lot of these insights with your students as an adjunct professor at uh, USC Thornton. You also, though, have another hat. You have a third hat, right? You are a partner in something called Foundy. What, what is that, and what is that adventure? Sure. So Foundy, uh, found.ee, for anybody who wants to find it, um, it is a free platform, but it's invite only. So if you go to found.ee uh, and you are in the music industry, you can get yourself a um, get yourself uh, account access um, and start using it. It is an, a full service advertising platform for the music industry uh, built to make the music industry be able to advertise um, from the smallest artist in the world to the biggest artist in the world um, just as easily as uh, have the major labels have been doing it for years with uh, display advertising on that gets to over 99% of the internet and with no minimums um, and audio ads on Spotify, iHeartRadio. Um, and the idea is that it's also attached directly to um, a data collection source. So um, one of the kind of leading areas of advertising in the world right now is retargeting. Um, and so what we, what is done, retargeting? I will, I will get into that. Um, <laughs> so retargeting is the idea that you put someone into a database, um, non-personalized data. So it's not, Hey, Gigi, I know you've been looking at, uh, this shirt online. It's, uh, we know person on this computer clicked on this shirt on a store. 
Um, and that adds a piece of data to your computer that communicates with the ad server. And that's called a cookie. Um, and that data lets an advertiser serve you buy ads against you as a user, uh, knowing what you've done. Most traditionally, um, this is done in e-commerce. So if you think of like, if you go to your favorite department store website, say Bloomingdale's, you look at a shirt, and then you go on um, rollingstone.com and that same shirt is looking at you, that's called retargeting. What the has developed in the last few years and what Foundy allows you to do is to add retargeting to an action. So it's a URL shortener. You add your iTunes URL or your Spotify URL to Foundy and it creates a new URL that is instead of a long string of numbers and, and letters along alphanumeric stream it's found.ee forward slash your album on itunes and so you control what that is you control the branding and then every time someone clicks on that they go into a database that you can then purchase ads against later on um, so the idea is that it's all connected to one platform this does we do have competitors in the marketplace um, but nobody else has it all connected into one platform where you can generate all your data you can you can collect all your data and then simply click from i want to target the 50,000 people who clicked on my itunes or my spot I mean, let's say let's not use itunes anymore since that side setting let's say i want to promote my album on Spotify to the 50,000 people that I know clicked on my song on Spotify. So you promote your single on Spotify, you use a Foundy link, 50,000 people click on it and listen to the song. Now you have a database of those people, you click advertise and now your album's out, you can buy advertising against them with, uh, against that exact 50,000 people with a CPC, which is a cost per click, the cost for reaching each individual that is comparable or competitive to social media. Uh, so Facebook advertising is the biggest advertising platform in the world. Our costs are comparable. And the ease of use compared to Google AdWords is insanely much easier. <laughs> Google AdWords is a very difficult system. We have stripped out everything that you would, would not want to use in Google AdWords as a musician and just put everything you would use as a musician in this platform. But then you know the behavioral information across many songs, across many people. Yes, Can people then advertise against other people's lists? The answer is you, you will be able to. Um, we are working on, on how to develop that. That's a privacy uh, discussion. Um, everything we do is GDPR compliant. Uh, GDPR is the European Union's privacy law that was enacted last year. Um, so we just need to be very careful that any data we are offering up, um, we own in joint with all of our users. There's a joint control agreement that every user signs um, the data, but we, we are very privacy uh, uh, conscious and we want to make sure that we're serving that in a conscientious way so we are working on ways to do that and then also if a major label vp of marketing is listening to this and wants it we are our, our one of our main investors is is concord music group um and we are building out full data management platforms for a for individuals we have we are we have a full data management platform coming but also for in bigger companies to be able to manage so that within a company you can do that so as you're building your own database of you know you, you have 13 15 20,000 masters or in some cases hundreds of thousands of masters in the case of the majors where you are promoting it over time and you have these clicks happening and this interaction happening where you will be able to build your own databases like that. Um, and yes, we have access to everything that's going on in the industry. So we can surface that information in data in ways that are, you know, pri is privacy conscious. And those are, those products are coming. Um, one other, one other just addition I'll add just for, for ease of use is it's not just links. It's also embed code. So you can, do content, and we also have a bulk link generator. So if you're going on tour, you can upload your entire tour to it and generate 20 links at once if you want. It doesn't have to be one at a time. So normally I would ask about this point as we're getting ready to wrap up, 
if there were any tools or other things that are pain points for you that you think someone should create, it sounds like you've done that. I can't take the credit for creating it. My colleague, Jason Hobbs is the founder and, and, and creator. I'm a partner in the business, but yes, we are, we are, we're, we have created this. Um, and I just want to give Jason a shout out for being the visionary on that. So as we are wrapping up, anything uh, that you'd like to wrap up with anything we haven't talked about or that you're passionate about that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, you know, I really would just, I, I am passionate about the next generation and where we're going. I think the main reason that I, um, do the adjunct professor work at USC and I've, I've come and talked to your students at UCLA. The reason I love reaching the next generation is I, I went to school, I went to USC. Sorry. I know you're, you're UCLA. Associate. No, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Trojan undergrad film school. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, great. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. yep. So um, fight on. Um, I went to USC from 2001 to 2005. Uh, and I was a music industry major. And if you think about what happened in the music industry in that time, it, iTunes was invented, the iPod was invented, uh, Google became a verb, YouTube was invented. Um, the And by, by within a year of Facebook was invented while I was there, I was one of the first 50 schools um, that got access to it. Um, Within a year of me graduating, 80% of record retail had gone out of business. So what I was being taught in the music industry program at USC was extraordinarily valuable, but was not the actual industry I was going to work in. I feel like we are in a place now where the industry is changing so rapidly that it's almost faster than that. And that what I'm learning from the 20-year-old interns in our office is super fascinating. So what I'm, I, I want to hear about is, you know, what's coming next? How are we moving? How are we moving forward? And that's why I do work, the work at the universities. Um, that's why I'm very passionate about working with our interns here at Friends at Work and, and understanding the next generation. So anybody who has ideas, I'm, I'm open to hear and, and talk to them. I'm always, I'm a, I'm a tech stars mentor also, so I'm always talking to new startups. Um, I, I am passionate about the future of the music industry and, and what technology and what trends are going to drive that. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining in this podcast. If someone wants to get a hold of you, how should they best find you? Um, you can go to friendsatwork.com, find out more about the company there and fill out the form field. Um, you can look me up. Uh, the form field goes directly to me at the time of this recording. I can't promise it will forever, but for you know a few weeks, at least it'll be safe. Um, my Social media handles are J.R. Gruber on Twitter and J.R. Gruber 01 on Instagram. And I believe you can look me up just at J.R. Gruber. That's the letter J, the letter R, Gruber on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, I'm open to people reaching out to me on any of those platforms. I don't post very often on any of them, but I am very accessible um, via direct message. Um, I would say Facebook Messenger is probably my least accessible because I just don't notice it that often, but everything else, you can reach me anytime. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, that wraps up this podcast. Many thanks to the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation for being our hosts of this ongoing series. You can subscribe to us in all the usual places, or you can come find us at innovation.schoolofmusic.ucla.edu. Join us again to follow the other adventures that we will be tracking down in innovating music. Thanks again.